All right. So uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Straight Science. Straight Science is a evening science presentation series put on by UAF Northwest Campus and UAF Alaska Sea Grant. We both, the campus and Sea Grant, serve the Bering Strait region, which is the homeland and waters of the Yupik, Inupiaq, and St. Lawrence Island Yupik peoples. And tonight is one that is uh, exciting for, for everyone. We have Dwayne Stevenson with NOAA Race Division as our speaker tonight. And Race Division is the research arm for NOAA Fisheries. And they do all the big research in our, uh, in our ways here with fisheries and fish, the whole ecosystem. Let me get that straight. Because NOAA Race Division, what does Race Division stand for? And there it is actually, Resource Assessment and Conservation Engineering Division. I'm sure Dwayne can answer any <laughs> questions about that title later. But in the interim, we're gonna dive right in. There is ongoing the NOAA Bottom Trawl Survey, which is giving us information from Dutch Harbor to Diomede and on in US waters. Um, that'll be very, very, informative for everyone, whether you live on the coast, whether you're subsistence or commercial, this is the state of the oceans. And so Dwayne is nice enough to take time out right now to give us from Seattle, the latest on where the ships are and kind of a preliminary uh, update on what's happened and where they are proceeding. So we're really grateful, Dwayne, and I will leave it at that. If we have any callers, know that callers will get priority uh, for any questions. Other than that, take it away, Dwayne. We're really interested. Edge of our seats right. kind of interested. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gay. Appreciate the introduction and appreciate the invite. It's always great to be able to share uh, some of the information uh, about the activities that we're uh, involved in in the Bering Sea and in particularly in the Bering Strait region. Um, you may have seen some of these talks before, some of you. Uh, they were presented by Lyle Britt. Uh, Lyle's in the audience now. He was the former lead of the Bering Sea Trawl Survey Group, um, but he did such a good job that he got promoted to a division level uh, position, and then I was promoted to take his place. So now you're stuck with me giving these talks. So I want to apologize up front because I don't have a whole lot of new data to share with you yet. We are, we've just finished the Eastern Bering Sea portion of our survey this year and begun the Northern Bering Sea portion uh, literally last week, a few days ago. Um, so we haven't done a lot of the number crunching yet. Um, so what I want to do today is give you an overview. I'm not advancing for some reason here. There we go. Basically give you a little bit of context about you know, what the survey is about in general, um, the recent survey work that we've done, particularly in the, in the Bering Strait region and Northern Bering Sea Survey Area, uh, why we're doing these surveys, what we hope to accomplish, some of the uh, biological and um, environmental contexts in which we're uh, collecting these data this year. So uh, a brief history of what we've seen over the past several years, and then just go over briefly what we're doing this year and, and where we are in terms of our survey season. So in general, we have been conducting uh, bottom trawl surveys in the Bering Sea for just about 40 years now. In fact, this year marks our 40th annual survey, trawl survey of the Eastern Bering Sea. Uh, we started what we consider our standardized Eastern Bering Sea bottom trawl surveys in 1982 and have conducted one every year uh, until this year with the exception of 2020, the, what we call the COVID year. And more recently, we've started doing a lot more work in the Northern Bering Sea. Um, there was some uh, sporadic work in the, in the Northern Bering Sea with trawl surveys back in the 80s and 90s, uh, but we really just got going with our standardized surveys in the Northern Bering Sea back in 2010. Um, and then we have been doing more regular work in the Northern Bering Sea since 2017. So most of what I'm going to present today uh, is context from the, the previous years in which we've done both the Eastern Bering Sea and Northern Bering Sea surveys. And those years are 2010, 
uh, and then 17, 19, and 21. And then if everything goes well this year, we'll have another year, 2022, to add to that time series. Um, some of you will also remember that we did a, a curtailed survey in the Northern Bering Sea in 2018. We call that a rapid response survey. That was a case where it was clear that there wasn't much seasonal sea ice in the Bering Sea that year. Um, and there was a lot of interest in trying to find out whether there, um, there, were a, there was additional fish movement into the Northern Bering Sea region in that year. So we did some sampling in the Northern Bering Sea that year, but it was a reduced uh, data set. So we generally don't include that with our long-term time series. In general, we try to time the surveys the same every year. We generally start in the Eastern Bering Sea uh, beginning of June on or about June 1st. This year, I believe we started May 30th, so we were right in there. And then we work our way from Bristol Bay um, to the north and west um, out to the Russian border in the northwest part of that Eastern Bering Sea survey area and generally arrive there around late July. And this year was was right on time. We, we finished up right around uh, July 30th. And then we transition directly into the Northern Bering Sea Survey area. So what we generally end up with is uh, starting in this uh, south southwest corner of the survey area and working our way toward Nome. We generally do a crew change and then work our way back toward the south. We have a, a lot of goals with this survey, uh, these, this survey effort, um, and there are, those goals generally revolve around uh, assessing the health and state of the fishes and invertebrates, essentially the ecosystem that's near the part of the ecosystem that's near the seafloor. Um, we're using a bottom trawl. It's right on the bottom. Its uh, vertical opening is about six to eight feet, two meters or so. So we're really only sampling the bottom part of the water column and really looking at those, uh, what we call benthic fishes and invertebrates, those things that are right on the seafloor or right above the seafloor. What we hope to do with these surveys um, is to monitor and document changes that are happening throughout the Bering Sea ecosystem. So we're not just looking at fishes, we're not just looking at one species of fishes, we're not concentrating on a pollock survey or a cod survey. What we're trying to do is assess the health and the status of the entire ecosystem to the best we can with our survey gear. Um, so we want to look at the changes throughout the Bering Sea food web to the extent that we can. And we want to, in particular, in the Northern Bering Sea, try to assess what changes are happening in the ecosystem that are associated with the loss of seasonal sea ice. In fact, when we started these surveys in the Northern Bering Sea, um, in, in the recent uh, series of these surveys anyway, it was originally based on funding that came from what, we, what was called the Loss of Sea Ice um, Initiative, uh, which was again designed to look at that changes that were resulting from decreased amount of seasonal sea ice in the, in the Northern Bering Sea. This is just to drive home the point that we're looking at the entire marine ecosystem. Um, our part again is the benthic uh, fishes and invertebrates of the ecosystem, but there are other researchers uh, in other groups of the Alaska Center that are looking at um, the pelagic uh, parts of the ecosystem, the midwater uh, fishes and invertebrates of the ecosystem, the nuston and the surface water plankton, uh, marine mammals. And of course, we can never forget that um, part of this ecosystem in Alaska is the human portion as well. So we try to keep in mind that what we're trying to assess, what we're trying to monitor, and what we're really interested in is the, the entirety of the ecosystem. OK, so to give you a little bit of context first about the environmental data that we collect, one of the things that gets the most interest that we collect is uh, temperature data. So every time we put a trawl in the water, every time we send our net over the stern ramp, it has a thermometer on it. Uh, we call it a, th a bathythermograph. Uh, it's on the top head rope of the net. And with that thermograph, we, we take a, a bottom temperature and a surface temperature. So these maps, each of these maps that you see here are generated from 500 data points uh, because we have 500 stations, 376 in the Eastern Bering Sea and another 144 in the Northern Bering Sea. And with those 500 temperature data points, we can produce these contour maps of temperature uh, in the Bering Sea. It's really nice when we do both the Eastern and Northern Bering Sea together because then we can get this, over, this really complete overall look of, uh, at the bottom temperatures in the region. 
And so this is the historical context of those temperature patterns that we see. Um, you'll see in 2010 here, and these, these temperatures are color coded by the, the darker blue, obviously the, the lower the temperatures. 2010 was what we consider the last cold year that we sampled in the Northern Bering Sea. And you can see that the, the main feature of that Bering Sea here is this large pool of really dark color, which represents really cold water, in this case, below zero degrees C. This is a large pool of cold water that's left over when uh, the sea ice, the seasonal sea ice retreats from the area. So we end up with this big mass of cold water right near the bottom. Um, and in cold years, when there's a lot of sea ice, that mass of cold water extends almost all the way down, as you can see here, to the Alaska Peninsula. What we've seen in recent years is very different. So 2017, and particularly 2019, and then to the same, to some extent in 21, were warmer years. We've seen, as you all know by now, we've seen a lot of uh, sequential warm years in the Bering Sea, years that are characterized by a relatively small amount of seasonal sea ice. When there's not a lot of sea ice in the winter, that translates to relatively small cold pools in the Bering Sea. So you can see in 2017, this pool of really cold water was much smaller than in 2010. And then in 2019, it was really small. There was very little really cold water. And essentially the cold pool, at least in the Eastern Bering Sea was non-existent. There was just this little area of cold water in the Northern Bering Sea. In 21, we saw a little bit more cold water. It wasn't quite as extreme a hot year or a warm year as we saw in uh, 2019 and 2018. Those seem to be the, the extreme warm years we've had recently. In 21, it was a little bit cooler. The other thing that you'll see here is that in addition to this pool of cold water, we've seen increasingly what I think Lyle called the hot tub one year, which is this area of really warm water in Norton Sound and right along the coast in the Northern Bering Sea. This really warm pool of water is a really interesting feature that seems to have shown up in the past few years. So spoiler alert, this is what we're seeing this year. Um, so this map shows temperature data from all of our bottom trawls in the Eastern Bering Sea from this year. So within each one of these squares and circles, we've completed a bottom trawl sample. And these uh, squares are color coded by the bottom temperature that we recorded at that station. And so what you'll immediately hopefully see is that um, we do have some cold water here in the mid part of, of the Bering Sea shelf. It, it's not super cold water. It's, we didn't see a whole lot of that uh, below zero water this year that we sometimes see in really cold years, but there is clearly a cold pool of water in the Eastern Bering Sea this year. Um, so this is looking somewhat like what we saw in 2021, except probably a little bit colder. We haven't done the, the mean temperatures overall yet, but I think what we're gonna see when we do the, the final number crunching is that this will be in the Eastern Bering Sea, a, a cooler year in terms of bottom, bottom temperatures than last year. And of course we haven't done much of any work yet in the Northern Bering Sea, so we're not really sure yet what that's going to look like. This is a map that's taken directly from our, our website. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But what we try to do when we're, when we're out there on the boat is, is send our bottom temperature data back to Seattle every day so that this map can be populated with new temperature data on a daily or almost daily basis. And that's something that we've gotten a lot of good feedback on in the last few years. People seem to really uh, appreciate the availability of those data. And so, because we're taking a temperature reading at each station, we can then um, combine all of those temperature readings uh, from the Eastern Bering Sea in particular and the Northern Bering Sea and come up with an overall annual mean temperature. And, and that's what this graph shows here on the left. It's the Eastern Bering Sea. You can see we take a surface temperature reading and we take a bottom temperature reading and then we can, we can take the mean of all those 376 bottom temperature readings and come up with a single dot, a single overall mean per year. And when we do that, we can see clearly and at a glance what the trends look like in terms of the overall climate of the Bering Sea. And uh, we see essentially the surface temperature trends monitoring the bottom temperature trends. And you know what we've seen, uh, particularly over the last 20 years is that in, 
in the in the 80s and 90s, we saw a lot of these warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold periods where we had one or two warm years followed by one or two cold years. But what we've seen a lot over the past 20 years is that we have several warm years followed by a bunch of cold years. And then of course, what we've seen in the, in the most recent past has been a bunch of, of warm years all on a row. Um, there's a gap here because we missed 2020, um, but this is the, the mean from 2021. Uh, not Again, not as extremely warm as what we saw in 2018 and 19, but definitely warmer than the mean. And I can go out on a limb now, I think, and say with in the, for the Eastern Bering Sea this year, we'll be a little bit colder than 2021. We'll be down here near the, the, the overall mean somewhere. And of course, we don't know yet what's going to happen this year in the Northern Bering Sea, but what we see here from the from the trend from the recent surveys is we had one cold year, and then the other three years that we've had recently have been relatively warm in comparison to 2010. Another thing we can do with these temperature data is look at the area of that cold pool that I was talking about. So that pool of really cold water that we see in the central part of the eastern Bering Sea shelf, right down the middle. Uh, you know, not not between the coastal waters and the outer shelf, is that is that pool of cold water that's left when the ice melts out, and we can track the area of that. We can use our temperature data to calculate the area of that cold pool. So the entire the proportion of the entire eastern Bering Sea shelf, in this case, that is covered by water of, depending on how you want to define the cold pool, less than two degrees, less than one degree, less than zero degrees. And that's what these jagged lines here show. And so basically in what you see here, when you see a lot of area that the, the cold pool area is relatively high, as much as 60 or 70% of the Eastern Bering Sea, what that means is those are overall cold years. And of course, when we get to the more modern surveys, what we see is we have, we've had a lot of really warm years. Again, 2018 and 19 were really warm years, and we had very little cold pool at all in the, Bering, in the Eastern Bering Sea. So essentially, in 2018, there was almost no cold pool at all in the Eastern Bering Sea. And then again, like you saw in the spatial map of temperatures, uh, last year, 2021 was a bit of a rebound. There was a little bit of a cold pool in the Eastern Bering Sea, and I expect we're going to see even more uh, area of cold pool this year in 2022. So that's the environmental backdrop of what we're talking about and what we're trying to uh, look at this year. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the biological context in which we're collecting our data this year. Um, and again, I'll basically concentrate on the last four uh, full Bering Sea surveys that we've done. So 2010 was that cold year. And then 17, 18, or 17, 19, and 21 were all warmer years. And I'm going to talk first about a couple of species that um, have done very well in the northern Bering Sea under this new climatic regime. And then a couple of species that have sort of maintained um, their population levels. And then a couple of species that have, have really been declining over the past few years in the northern Bering Sea. And so many of you have seen um, these figures before. Um, this is showing spatially what we've seen in the Northern Bering Sea in particular over the past several years. Um, when we sampled up here in a cold year in the Northern Bering Sea, we saw almost no pollock. Same thing with cod, which I'll show next. We saw very little uh, biomass of cod and pollock in the Northern Bering Sea. And that, of course, changed dramatically when we got into the warm years of 2017 and 19 in particular, in which we saw these huge populations of cod and pollock that had, that had gone into the Northern Bering Sea and were, were really concentrated up here in particular around St. Lawrence Island and north of the Bering Strait. If you look at the biomass numbers, that's where it really becomes striking, because the difference between the 2010 estimated biomass of Pollock in the Northern Bering Sea versus the 2017, it was an increase of over 6,000 percent. So there was just a just an unbelievably dramatic increase in the Pollock biomass in the Northern Bering Sea during that on that time interval. And since then, those Pollock numbers have come down in the Bering Sea and came down quite a bit in the Northern Bering Sea last year, actually. But still, um, as I'll show in a later slide, if you, if you look from 2010 to 2021, even if you, um, you know, just ignoring the fluctuations in the middle, there's still, you know, 20 times as many Pollock in the, in the Northern Bering Sea in 21 as there were in, in 2010. 
And the reason that we think about the cold pool so much, you can really see, I, I used to have some figures where you could see the outline of the cold pool on these maps. And that was great because you could really see how the pollock and cod distribution in particular really lined up at the edge of that cold pool. And although you can't see it on these maps, that cold pool in 2010 extends right to the edge of this pollock distribution here. And the same thing in 2017. So you can really see, if you have those, those maps together, you can really see how um, the fact that that cold pool area and the distribution of several species are really tightly correlated. And that's why we care so much about that cold pool area because essentially where the cold pool is, a lot of the species of fishes are not. So that's Pollock. Uh, another species that's done very well in Northern Bering Sea is Cod. Same thing we see at the distribution for Cod that we saw with Pollock. Um, you know, 2010, very little cod in the northern Bering Sea, but by 2017, we really saw the infiltration of a lot of Pacific cod in the northern Bering Sea, um, and they really seem to have done very well in the northern Bering Sea during the warm years. Like Pollock, we saw a slight decline last year in the in the cod numbers for the northern Bering Sea, um, and uh, so. Also like Pollock, you can see that even if you, even though there is a decline for 2021, we're still talking about about uh, 10 times the number of cod in 2021 that we saw in the Northern Bering Sea in 2010. So in general, throughout this climactic change or this climatic change that we're, we're seeing in the Bering Sea with warming water, uh, warming climate regime, we're seeing that the cod and the Pollock are, are doing very well in this region. Now, a couple of species that are sort of uh, not showing particular, not showing dramatic trends, let's say. Um, I know everybody is interested in red king crab. Uh, we have seen, um, we've definitely seen some declines in the overall red king crab populations in the Eastern Bering Sea. Um, we're seeing uh, in the past couple of years, we're seeing about half the biomass of red king crabs in the Eastern Bering Sea that we used to see back in 2010. The overall distribution of red king crabs, you can see, is not changing very much over the years. Um, what we are seeing, though, is changes in the overall numbers, the overall biomass, the overall total weight of the population in the eastern Bering Sea. In the northern Bering Sea, things are a little bit different. In the, east, in the northern Bering Sea, uh, we actually saw a pretty good increase in, in 2021. Um, but in general, um, the numbers for uh, biomass of red king crabs in the northern Bering Sea are um, are not changing quite as dramatically as, as we see with cod and pollock. Another one that we're not seeing dramatic changes in in the Northern Bering Sea is Pacific halibut. Uh, I mean, this is a species that we don't see dramatic changes in the distribution for. So, you know, basically where the halibut are in cold years seems to not be terribly different from where the halibut are located in, in warm years. Um, and you can see in the Northern Bering Sea, the biomass in 2010 was almost the same as the biomass we saw in 2021. And so it's been holding relatively steady in the Northern Bering Sea over the time period. We are seeing some declines or some uh, relatively significant declines in halibut numbers in the Eastern Bering Sea, even though we saw a little bit of an increase uh, last year, um, the halibut numbers are still down in the Eastern Bering Sea from what we had in 2010. So again, the, the red king crab and the halibut not dramatic changes like we see uh, for the pollock and the cod. Now, there are a couple of species that we're seeing dramatic changes in the other direction, uh, that is dramatic declines in the Northern Bering Sea. And you're, this is probably not gonna be a surprise to anyone. Uh, snow crab, uh, we have seen pretty dramatic declines in the snow crab population in the Northern Bering Sea over the last 10 years. Uh, pretty significant declines every year that we've done a survey. And last year was no different. Uh, another 54% decline between 2019 and 2021 in the Northern Bering Sea. And then the big news last year from the Eastern Bering Sea survey was we saw a dramatic decline for the snow crab populations in the Eastern Bering Sea. So from 2019 to 21, we were down, our, our, our snow crab biomass estimate was down about 75%. So that's a major issue. It's something that got everybody's attention and we're very uh, interested and nervous to see what, what our numbers will, will show us this year. Um, but they're, they, they appear to be declining both in the Northern and the Eastern Bering Sea. And then the other species that I wanted to point out that will be no surprise to you that's declining in the Northern Bering Sea is saffron cod. Um, 
this is a case where you know it's, it seems like every time we do a survey, we see less and less uh, saffron cod. And um, in, in, in general, we've only really seen large numbers of saffron cod in the northern Bering Sea. But as you can see in the cold year, 90,000 metric tons was our estimate of biomass in the northern Bering Sea. And last year, uh, it was one tenth of that, down 90% essentially from from the 2010 biomass estimate. Again, we're not seeing major changes in the distribution of the species here, um, but what we are seeing is that where we're seeing saffron cod, we're just seeing a lot less of them. And again, I imagine that's not a surprise to, to the most of the folks that are listening here today. We've all seen that happening. So to summarize this, the, the sort of biological view of, of the recent surveys that we've done in the Northern Bering Sea, um, there are some species that are doing very well. There are species that are increasing their biomass dramatically in the Northern Bering Sea. Again, I, I pointed out walleye, pollock, and Pacific cod, but also Northern rock sole. We're seeing more herring, um, jellyfish. Um, so those species um, seem to be uh, seem to be doing well in the northern part of the Bering Sea uh, with the warm water. And then there are some species that are sort of holding steady. Um, and the ones that I pointed out were the red king crab. Uh, and, and halibut, and then there are also species that are are not doing so well. Um, Arctic cod, we hardly see any Arctic cod in the, in the northern Bering Sea anymore, and saffron cod, and some of the tunicates as well. We've seen large declines in over the over the past few years, few survey years. So that's the biological context in which we're surveying this year. So here we are again surveying the Northern Bering Sea in 2022. Thankfully, we're back at it. We are trying to repeat exactly what we did in 2021, exactly what we did in 2019, and exactly what we did in 2017. We're trying to assess the same, the same stations, collect uh, the same types of data at the same stations so we can get a good long-term monitoring series going for, for the Northern Bering Sea region. Uh, this map shows the stations that, oh geez, didn't mean to do that. Uh, this map shows the stations that have already been completed in black, and then the and then the yellow X's are the stations that are planned for the next two days. So um, our first Northern Bering Sea stations were done on July 29th. As I mentioned, we finish up the Eastern Bering Sea uh, here in the northwest corner of the survey area, and then we just start directly on the Northern Bering Sea stations. So essentially, the boats were able to do two days of sampling here in the southwest corner of the Northern Bering Sea area before coming to Nome for a crew change. The boats were here in Nome, uh, I believe uh, July 30th through August 2nd. Uh, some of you may have seen them at the dock there. That was our last crew change. Uh, then we got some new folks on the boat and headed out and one of the boats began sampling Norton Sound right away. And they are right here today, I believe. Uh, and we'll be working up the rest of Norton Sound tomorrow and the next day. And then the other boat went straight up toward the Bering Strait. Um, they're up near up near the Diomedes now, and we'll be working their way back to the south over the next couple of days. And it, basically, the boats are going to work their way to the south and to the and to the west uh, for two more weeks, uh, a little over two more weeks. And then about uh, August 20th uh, or thereabouts, they're going to have to break and head back back south to to Dutch Harbor for for offloading the boats and, and cleaning up all the gear. Uh, we are hoping that we will be able to get all the rest of these stations done by then. Um, but at this point, I think we're gonna be cutting it close. Um, as far as when the boats will be approaching St. Lawrence Island, uh, my best guess at this point is um, they'll be looking at doing these stations somewhere around August uh, 7th, 8th, 9th, sometime in that, in that time frame. These are the boats. These are the same boats that we've used for, for many years now. We know them well. They've worked well for us. They're working well for us again this year. Um, great platforms for us to do these trawl surveys on. Um, they're big enough to tow our nets with no problem and and, and house our, com our scientists comfortably, but not so big that, that we have problems getting into shallow water. And, and uh, they're, they're generally pretty manageable and have, have been great platforms for us. So if you see them, the, uh, the Alaska Knight is out there. And, I believe that one was, that's the one that was in the Gnome Nugget today, it sounds like, and in the Vester Island as well. So those are the two boats that you'll see out there doing our bottom trawl survey this year. So 
um, most of what we collect uh, is biological data. You know, we collect, we count fish, we weigh fish, we count invertebrates, we weigh invertebrates, uh, we identify everything, we collect stomach samples, we collect otolith samples, all sorts of biological data. But in addition to that, what we're really trying to uh, increase our capabilities for is collecting environmental data. Uh, and as I mentioned and talked about a lot, we collect water temperature data, which is, has been very useful for a number of folks over the years. Uh, but we're also trying to improve our collections of things like salinity gradients in the water column, uh, light data collections, uh, and then of course we do uh, weather observations as well. And these uh, environmental data streams are something that we're uh, that, that they're getting a lot more interest, uh, and so we're trying to increase our capabilities as far as those things are concerned. Uh, the environmental conditions that we're seeing in 2022, um, I already talked about this. Uh, this is the map of the bottom temperature data that we've already collected. Looks like it's a colder year than it was last year um, in general. And if you look at the, um, and there are a lot of different ways that you can look at ice cover in the Arctic and in the Bering Sea, and it's kind of a rabbit hole to go down sometimes. So I'm never sure which figure to show, but, but basically this one is just a, just gives an overall picture of what the sea ice extent is in the Arctic this year versus previous years. And what you can see is this, you know, this, this blue line here 20 for 2022, definitely below the long-term mean, long-term average. So it's a colder year than the long-term average, the long-term median, but um, I mean, a, a warmer year than the long-term median, but not as warm as the last couple of years have been, not as warm as those extreme years that we saw uh, 2018 and 2019. So those data are all sort of telling us and showing us the same thing. We do a lot of work on these surveys that is that aside from the typical biological collections, we, we collect all sorts of data out there. We, we realize that we have a great platform of opportunity to collect lots of data streams and lots of projects. And so we do a ton of work out there. Um, I'm not going to talk about all these projects, but they run the gamut from, you know, acoustic and, uh, and environmental data that I've already talked about to genetics collections and, and um, uh, uh, things for like, you know, training collections for outreach. We do a lot of outreach with, uh, with different students, observer programs, that sort of thing. Uh, we do a lot of genetics collections and we do some tagging stuff that I'm going to talk about more in a minute here. But all of these things are, are projects um, that are uh, very valuable parts of what we do in addition to the standard sampling. And it seems like we get more of them every year, although this list I think is very similar to the one we had last year where we're really starting to see some projects come in that are, that are long term and, are, and are, are really paying off for us. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about a few of them. Uh, many of you have probably already know about the Pacific Cod tagging study. We have been uh, putting these satellite tags, uh, these huge satellite tags on Pacific cod specimens for a few years now. Um, we started this as a collaborative project with uh, NSEDC uh, and worked with some, some local fishermen there in the Strait region to help us tag some, some cod over the years. We've, we've tagged, uh, we tagged 38 fish in 2019 uh, and, then a, and then a bunch more in 21. And we're hoping that we'll get about 15 fish tagged this year. This year, the um, the industry was uh, was was very generous in providing us with some with some tags to put on cod this year, and the reason that they're doing that, and the reason that everybody seems to be interested in these data, is that one of the central questions behind you know the the changes we're seeing in these populations and where they are is what do cod movement patterns look like? What do pollock pattern, movement patterns look like? How far are these fish actually traveling and where are they coming from and where are they going? And with these satellite tags, one of the things that we can do is we not only know where we deployed the tag and where we recovered the tag or where it popped up because the tags pop up and then upload their data to a satellite, but we also can reconstruct the cod's uh, movement pattern in between those two time points. So we can see, okay, in this case with the cod here and depicted uh, in the lower right, we can see that this fish, although it was tagged in the summer in the Northern Bering Sea, swam all the way to the Pribilofs probably to spawn uh, in Pribilof Canyon, and then came back up to the Northern Bering Sea the next summer. And what we're noticing with, with these, tagged, the, these tag data is that cod move a lot. They swim a long way. Uh, some of the cod that we tagged in the Northern Bering Sea have ended up in Russian waters. Some of them have ended up, one of them ended up in the Gulf of Alaska. 
So they they swim a long way, and that's a that's been a really eye-opening experience I think for us, and that has encouraged us to to continue to expand that project and keep putting more tags on fish so we can learn more about where they're going. So we're doing that again this year. Another thing we're really starting to ramp on up on is looking at fish condition. Um, you know, one of the measures of a population is how many fish are there and how many fish are not there. Obviously the biomass, the abundance, the numbers and the weight, total weight of the fish that are there. But another interesting thing to measure is what condition are the fish in that you're actually seeing? So we may be seeing the same numbers of fish that we saw in the past, but are they in the same condition they were in the past? And are, for, for example, Pacific cod and other species experiencing increased adult mortality because their overall body condition is, is declining for, for lack of food resources or whatever. So we feel like we can uh, get a lot of information about populations just by looking at fish condition. And there are a lot of ways you can measure fish condition and we're starting to really hone in on a couple of, of, of good ways to, to get a fish condition index for, for several species of fish that we're seeing in the Bering Sea. And then hopefully with that information, we can help be, we can be a little bit more predictive about what adult mortality might look like. So we can make some predictions about, you know, what we might see in the following year based on the condition of the fish that we see this year. Help us give, get some more early warning signs if something's going wrong or something is declining. So we're doing that uh, project again this year. And then lastly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the harmful algal bloom uh, project that we've been doing in cooperation with Northwest Center and uh, Gay Sheffield with UAF. Uh, that's been a great collaboration in which we are trying to collect uh, bivalves and worms from the Northern Bering Sea when we get them to assess the levels of saxitoxin. Um, obviously, the, the, the presence of, uh, of harmful toxins from, from algal blooms are something that uh, folks who subsist on uh, marine organisms are very interested in knowing about. Um, we are really interested in trying to find out more information about the levels of saxitoxin that might be present in the Northern Bering Sea um, so that we can um, so that we can warn people if there are problems, so that we can try to uh, predict when there might be problems, so that we can uh, just learn more about the, the spread of these algal blooms and, and Gay's helping us do that. So that's a great project that we're working on this year as well. And then the last thing I want to talk about today is just um, one of the things that we've really tried to concentrate on over the last uh, few years is increasing our uh, amount of public outreach, in particular, the access that the public has to our data sets um, and the ease with which, you know, we can, um, you know, transparently give people um, access to our data. So there are three um, three efforts that I want to just talk about briefly here. The first one I've already talked about a little bit, and most of you probably know about the real the real time bottom temperature information that we put out there on a daily basis. Uh, you probably see that pop up on Facebook every few days. Um, and that's something that we've worked on for a few years now, and, and it's, uh, I think, going really well. Uh, but then I want to talk about a couple of other um, data initiatives here today, too. Um, one of which it really increases the public's access to our catch data. So you as a member of the general public can go to this website and download all of our catch data from previous years if you want. And another one is this uh, mapping, uh, this mapping uh, application. So I just want to talk about each one of those real quickly. Here's what our bottom temperature website looks like. Um, you can uh, access this anytime. There's the website, and it will show. It shows. It has. It has a really neat GIF which shows the what I think of as the marching bottom temperatures of the Bering Sea. So it'll start on day one and show you these temperatures, and then the temperatures will just march across the the Bering Sea. So you can see the progress of the survey and the trail of temperature data uh, that are left behind. And that's something again that we've gotten a lot of really good feedback on, and is available to to everyone. Another thing that we've just really gotten off the ground this year is housing our data through what um, NOAA calls FOSS or the Fisheries One Stop Shop. And what the organization is trying to do is, is, is create a one, a, like they say, a one stop shop, one area where you can go to get data, um, catch data for all of these surveys that are happening all over the country. Um, so you can get data from surveys that are done in New England or the Gulf of Mexico. Um, 
it through this data portal. And just recently, we have all of our data on this portal as well. So you can search, you can go to this uh, website and you can uh, use our data to search uh, for a particular species or a particular region or a particular survey year. And what you end up with is getting this, you know, you know this download of a spreadsheet of, in this case, I search for saffron cod for the 2021 Northern Bering Sea Survey. And then you'll get a list of all the places where we caught saffron cod in that year, the numbers that we caught there. And you can, uh, you can get those data for any year you want, any species you want. So I think that's a really, much improved user interface and a much easier way for the public to get access to our data. And then the last one is what we call DISMAP or what NOAA calls DISMAP, a distribution mapping and analysis portal. And this is a way where you can go to this website, launch this portal and actually see the same kind of data that I showed before, but this time in mapping form. So you can go in and look for saffron cod and see and generate a map just like this. And the really interesting thing about this mapping software is that you can actually march it through time. So in this case, this, these are the saffron cod that we caught in the Eastern Bering Sea in 2017. So you can see in general where we caught them and something about the biomass at each of those sites. Then if you click on it, you can go to 2018. I don't know where to click here. There we go. So 2017, 2018, 2019. And you can scroll through all the years you want from 1982 to through 2019 and see what the general trends in, in, in our catch data have been for any species you want. Um, so I think that's a really neat tool uh, and a really useful way for people to see what our data look like. We don't yet have the Northern Bering Sea data in this mapping portal yet, but we're working on it. So hopefully at some point soon, we'll have the Northern Bering Sea data in there as well. Okay, so um, just by way of sort of buttoning this up here um, and opening up for questions, um, it's, it, it seems silly for me to write this. It seems silly for me to say this, but the Bering Sea is changing. You guys all know that. You all see that around you. And we see that when we do these bottom trawl surveys. And that's why it's important for us to keep doing them. And that's why we're really interested in maintaining and building this time series. Because as the ecosystem changes, we want to try to keep track of what's happening there and and hopefully um, try to explain why it's happening in the long term. Uh, it looks like this year um, from the preliminary bottom temperature data that we've got that the Eastern Bering Sea uh, cold pool is larger this year than it was in 2019 and 2021. Um, so a little bit cooler this year on the bottom, but certainly still uh, warmer than, than a lot of the historical data. And um, of course, we just finished up the Eastern Bering Sea survey last week and are moving on to the Northern Bering Sea now. So uh, we've got folks out there on two boats as we speak, uh, sampling the Northern Bering Sea survey area. Um, and hopefully we'll come back and, uh, or I'll come back and present the results of that survey uh, again here in the fall. I'd love to be able to travel to Nome again. Um, we'll see how that goes with, with what's happening with the pandemic, but um, always, I'm looking forward to getting back up there at some point soon. And then I just wanted to, um, you know, emphasize again that we're we're trying really hard to increase our our opportunities for uh, public access to our data. Uh, we really uh, want everyone to be able to see what we're doing out here, to see what the data look like, and to be able to use those data. So hopefully we're we're making strides in that direction. And that's all I've got. So happy to take questions. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dwayne, and. Um... That was a good review of where we are and 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 whatnot. So thank you. And you already have a question in the chat. Um, for those, this is the time when uh, it's always good because it's never easy to be a public uh, speaker. Throw Dwayne a little love there for giving us his time. He's an hour off uh, our time. And he's still at it and giving us information um, as best he can on, on what's going on, especially since they just literally had the boats in here and shoved off again. So thank you, Dwayne. All right, I see Wes and Charlie. I'm just gonna go to the first question because way in the back in the chat, Jim Armstrong asked, is the sampling pattern in the Northern Bering Sea, and that is go to the Southwest corner, jump to the Northeast, then work back to the Southwest, is this the same pattern as in previous years? Yes, generally it is. And that's 
a pattern that's really determined to a large extent by logistics. Uh, because when we uh, when we finish up the Eastern Bering Sea Survey, um, it doesn't really make sense logistically <coughs> to run all the way back to Nome and then to come back out and start surveying. So when we have a few days to get some sampling done there in that area, we want to you know, we want to get it done and, and use the charter days that we have to the best of our ability. And so generally that's the way it works. When we finish the Eastern Bering Sea, we have a few days that we can use to get those far Western stations. And we've done that regularly for, for all of the modern surveys. And then once we get into Nome, it makes the most sense for one boat to go and do Norton Sound and the other boat to go to the Bering Strait and, and work to the Southwest from there. So in general, the answer is yes, that's the same pattern that we've used in the past. Um, there have been some problems in, in, to some extent in the past with things like boat breakdowns and things and things like that that sort of disrupt that pattern to some extent. But in general, like the Eastern Bering Sea, we try to maintain uh, as much as possible the same pattern of occupying stations every year. All right. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen yeah. on the question slide, it'd be great because then for me, you're you're tiny. There you go. All right. And Wes had his hand up first, followed by Charlie. Go ahead, Wes. Oh, okay. My question was back to uh, you mentioned the cod moving farther north and, su and such. Um, what's the current state of looking at what's happening in the Chukchi and your thoughts on what's going into the Chukchi Sea and then coming back south, say? Or, uh, and, and is there any plans for survey work in that region? We are um, acutely aware of the interest in data from the Chukchi Sea. Um, at this point, we have not been able to um, get the funding to extend our survey into the Chukchi Sea, but we are planning um, uh, and designing a Chukchi survey for in anticipation of getting those funds. So we're hoping that within the next few years that will happen and we'll be able to extend our survey into the Chukchi so we can get a better look for you know, now that we know the fish are, um, are, are going all the way up to the Bering Strait, we know they're not stopping there. We know they're going into the Chukchi. And so it's, it's going to be of, of great interest to a lot of people what those populations in the Chukchi look like. Um, so we're hoping to, to, to start looking into that very soon. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. That, that is of great interest in this region. So thank you, Wes. All right, Charlie, followed by Franz. Oh, okay. I had a hard time there getting switched on, but thank you. That's all right. And and uh, yeah, you, the survey that Noah's done over the years has been so interesting and and really. Uh, I was a fishing game manager in the '80s, and uh, the 1978 trawl survey was my Bible for probably 10 years about fish distribution and invertebrate distribution. And, and I, I really, uh, really do appreciate all this. Um, I've already made the pitch once, but that 78 survey was, was extensive. I know it's slightly different methodology, but boy, it'd be nice to have one more data point way back when. And, uh, and also, I, I had a question on salinity, and, and I, I appreciate the temperature data, but I think the other the other big physical factor that changes fish distribution is is salinity, and, and a, a graph of uh, halocline's or something like that would be really interesting to me. So I wondered if that was available. Yeah, excellent point. And for the past several years, we have been deploying a, a large CTD on our, our net as well. So we do have um, we do have temperature pro, temp, or uh, salinity profile data um, from the past several years. Um, and, and the problem is that we haven't really uh, we don't have an expert in that realm at this point. So it's it's hard for us to get the data processed into a usable form. But we do have those data available, and um, we'd be happy to chat with you if you're interested in using them about how we could make that stuff available. Thank you. All right, 
Franz, I see you. Good to see you. And followed by Rick. Actually, I think Rick had his hand up first. I'll, I'll yield, to, yield to Rick first. All right, yield to Rick. Oh, it doesn't make any difference. Um, uh, thanks very much, Dwayne. This real, I just really want to thank you and the race division for, for providing this in, in real near real time. This is really helpful to get um, now as opposed to um, you know, um, at, at a conference in, in the middle of winter. It's, this is really so helpful, so thank you. Um, I do have a que my one question, and I think Lyle may have touched on this in years past, and I can't remember the answer, so I'll ask you. On the bottom temperature data, because um, it's done over the course of several months, um, is, is there any kind of adjustment made to the raw data to try to make it more um, synchronous or uh, look synchronous, or is it because you're doing the, this survey in the same same way that you just use the raw data? Thank you. Yeah, we just what we're showing is is the raw data, and you know essentially what we have is, you know, we have the thermograph on there taking a, a temperature reading every three seconds, I think it is, and we're just taking the overall mean of those three second readings for the entire time the net is on the bottom. That does result in some uh, anomalies because we can't sample everything at once, right? So in some cases, like like in, in, for our temperature maps, you'll see often that there's kind of a break north of Nunavak where the water is really warm north of Nunavak and quite a bit colder right at Nunavak. And that's a temporal issue because we're sampling that area north of Nunavak a month later than we're sampling Nunavak itself. But that's really, I think, the most major um, temperature artifact that we see there. Um, but to answer your question in general, no, we haven't really done any corrections for those data for, for um, uh, the temporal lag. OK, great. That's really helpful. Thank you. My turn. I guess you're, you're muted, Gay, but that's all right. <laughs> um, Got it. Yeah, th thanks. Thanks, Dwayne. That, uh, uh, again, I'll add my thanks to Rick's as well for uh, presenting this um, kind of preview early on and a uh, nice overview. Um, actually, I just want to follow up briefly on what Rick was asking about. I actually did some uh, analyses along those lines to try to kind of correct for that, the mm -hmm. temporal warming over the season. But um, it kind of turns out it's pretty hard because it's really confounded with a spatial pattern because you tend to sample from east to west. So you can't really tease apart the temporal warming from sort of the spatial patterns, unfortunately. Although to some extent it's possible. And the other thing to follow up on that is that in your time series, um, in uh, I think it was in particular in 1999, it's always a really unusually cold year. Mm -hmm. um, and that is actually a little dampened if you correct for the timing of the survey in that year, because I think it occurred a bit earlier too that year. So there's the interannual pattern could be adjusted a little bit as well. Um, I don't know if you guys have looked at that at all, but my my real you can address that if you want. But my real question was actually about Pacific cod. Um, the example you showed was um, a fish tagged off of St. Lawrence, I think it looked like, um, and I was wondering if you. Um, how you decide where to tag the fish and if you spread that out over uh, kind of all the northern Bering Sea and uh, and if you have enough of a sample size to be able to tell apart different kind of migratory patterns depending on where they are caught. Yeah, uh, the sample size question, you know, I think uh, the short answer to that is we don't really have much of a sample size to make huge generalizations uh, at this point, um, but we're hoping to get there. Um, as far as the tagging locations go, the first tagging effort um, in the northern Bering Sea, we decided we wanted to concentrate on two areas. One was the northwest side of St. Lawrence Island, and one was the south southeast side of St. Lawrence Island, because that's where we had seen essentially large aggregations of cod the previous years. And so we essentially thought we had a good chance of getting uh, a large number of cod tagged in those areas. Um, and that worked out pretty well. Um, since then, cod have become harder to find in, in the northern Bering Sea. So it's be become a lot more opportunistic in, you know, in terms of the, the, the spatial distribution of where we tag fish and where we release fish. Um, because you, know, you got to be in relatively shallow water if you expect them to survive 
Um, you know, it's got to be relatively calm when you're caching them and releasing them. Um, so there are a lot of really difficult logistical constraints that really drive where we tag fish at this point more than anything else. Yeah, thanks. And I just follow up on that first point. Is there, are you guys looking at that sort of to try to do, um, you know, a little better in terms of correcting for the day of sampling? Um, both interannually, if the survey differs in the time in overall timing, and if uh, and to correct for the seasonal warming. Uh, we we don't have anyone specifically you know working on that at this point. Um, we do very much make an effort to um, you know make the calendar timing of the the start of the survey the same every year as much as we can, or within a couple of days as much as we can. Um, but in terms of doing some sort of temporal correction like that, we don't have anyone working on that currently. All right. Thanks. All right, and Lyle, hang on one sec because I'm going to hit the chat box. And uh, Chad C says uh, thank you to you, Dwayne, and Lyle, and Suzanne for the partnership with industry on deploying satellite tags on COD. Do you foresee any challenges in distributing the remaining satellite tags in the northern Bering Sea leg of the survey? Well, it's always dependent on finding the fish. <laughs> so um, I, we went out last year expecting to, to, to see cod everywhere in the Northern Bering Sea. And we had a bunch of tags to deploy and we really struggled to get them all deployed, just finding the fish and finding the time to do it. Um, so I guess I really can't answer that question. Um, I, don't, I don't see why it would be any more difficult than it has been in previous years, as long as we can find some fish. So if we can find the fish, we'll get the tags on them. Awesome. Thank you. And hopefully that answered it for you, Chad. Um, and also, Charlie, in case you zip off, know that there's a chat for you in the chat box. And it says from Lyle Britt, hey, Charlie, new survey modeling methodologies are being explored as a way to help bring more historical data into the fold. So hope that um, hope that helps. That's great. OK. All right. Lyle, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Gay. Um, I just wanted to follow up, I guess, on um, both Rick's comments and um, uh, uh, Franz's as well about the temperature data and say that we, we did explore, it's been a few years now, but we did explore looking at trying to do corrections. And one of the things that we found is that it works okay with our surface temperatures. It does not tend to work okay with our near seafloor bottom temperatures. And with the seafloor near bottom temperatures, the correction again kind of works a little bit when you're in the near source stations because they will warm up in kind of a given set manner. But as you move further offshore, get closer to the cold pool, factors like that, it tends to um, create some, um, I guess, thermal re uh, resistance there. They don't change as quickly. And so when we apply a lot of the kind of uh, methodologies that have been created to this day, it tends to create a situation where it um, artificially warms the um, uh, essentially like the whole Eastern Bering Sea Basin series of temperatures. So you can start losing cold pool by trying to do the correction. And when we've done actual like resample toes where we go back two months later and sample, we have an idea of how much correction there should be. And it's usually very little. So that's kind of one of the challenges. And that is actually kind of the reason why we just kind of gave up doing it is that it looks like the vast majority of our stations hold fairly close, at least for the seafloor temperatures over the course of a season. Yeah, thanks. That's really helpful. Awesome. Thank you, Lyle. All right. Any other questions? There's some nice kudos. Oh, wait, there is one. Oh, Megan Gannon with the Gnome Nugget. My mic is not working. Oh, geez. Sorry, Megan. <laughs> uh, but I have a question about the history of the trawl program. Why was the Northern Bering Sea trawl program only started in 2010? Are there any data points or temperature records from pre-2010 that can help NOAA reconstruct the shape of the coal pool further in the past. And I would assume that would be with a Northern Bering Sea yeah. Yeah. flavor. Yeah, there were there were sampling efforts, trawling efforts in the in the Northern Bering Sea before 2010. Um, particularly in the 80s and 90s, there were some sporadic survey activities there. 
um, that just didn't cover the entire survey area. Some of them, you know, were just Norton Sound or, uh, you know, just the, uh, you know, the, the Chirikoff Basin or something or something like that. So it was it was just the reason that we don't generally include those in the in the newer time series is because they weren't the coverage wasn't consistent, uh, the timing wasn't necessarily consistent, um, and the gear wasn't always consistent. Um, but there are data there. Um, historical data from prior to 2010. And um, one of the ways that we are changing what we do in terms of um, in terms of looking at fish populations is looking at model-based uh, biomass estimation. And one of the th one of the great things about model-based estimation of biomass is you can uh, correct for, you can you can use data that have gaps like that. Um, data years where you only have part of the survey area covered or years where you don't have any of the survey area covered. So um, we are looking at those data for some things, um, but it's it's hard to be consistent about it because those those efforts were really, um, really sporadic. So I don't know if that answers your question, but we do have some historical data that we've looked at. Okay, she says thanks. Sorry, Megan, that you're oh, darn your mic doesn't work. If you have any other questions, type them up quick. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dwayne, on that. For for me, my question, you know, uh, Wes was kind of right on the money there about wondering. If, my question was going to be, you know, is there plans afoot to get up north of Diomede, and you answered that. And one of the things I was curious is about, about is it was about this time last year that we started to see the trawlers, I believe they were trawlers, go north into the central Chukchi Sea. We saw one joined by two soon after, and then they went south uh, on the Russian EEZ. And they mm -hmm. went, I mean, they were central Chukchi, and then they dropped down going southwest off the north shore of the Chukotka Peninsula, and they sort of went back and forth and back and forth up there. Um, mm -hmm. Is there, it's a little early, I guess, but has there been, I don't know if anyone's watching, you know, we watch, there's a, a few of us down here that keep an eye on that, but I didn't know if Noah was keeping an eye on what was happening, or if by miracle of miracles, you had any communications with uh, transboundary with our neighbors to the west. Yeah, well, we know that there were Russian boats fishing for Pollock in the Chukchi last year. Um, we, I don't think we have a great idea of, of how well they did fishing for Pollock up there. Um, and, you know, obviously, U.S.-Russian relations have taken a bit of a downturn since last year. Um, so the lines of communication that were open even last year are not as open this year. Um, I have, personally, I haven't heard anything about Russian boats going north into the Chukchi this year. Um, I suspect that, you know, like with us and like with the, um, you know, American fishing industry, um, a deterrent for doing that is the cost of fuel. Um, and that's just a long way to go uh, to catch to catch Pollock. But I haven't heard anything is, is the short answer. And I'm, I'm not so I'm not sure if they're going up there this year or not. All right. Well, thanks. We're kind of trying to keep an eye on that. Um... And maybe I see Wes Jones, you have your hand up. You go for it. You may have news. I was just gonna say that in general, what I've what I seen this year on the Russian side is the the main portion of the Russian fleet hasn't moved uh, north of uh, Cape Navarin and and into like the Gulf of Anadir, which last year by this time they were in the Gulf of Anadir pretty heavy and clear up to the 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 north side of the Gulf of Anadir, and they really haven't done that yet this year. They've stayed much farther south, but we have seen one long liner that was that got right up next to the strait about three weeks ago, but they've since went back south. So that's a little bit from what I've seen so far. Thanks. That's awesome. Thank you, Wes. Wes always checks, and uh, NSCDC does does keep track of what's going on in our neighborhood, and it is greatly appreciated. If that helps, Dwayne. Um, all right. The other thing is, for those of you who want to hear how this story turns out, since this was a like a review and an update, um, and I also actually I could put in Dwayne. I just did a screen grab, kind of off of your near temperature 
because there's a bit of an update from one, the one you showed, I think, where some of those pretty hot temperatures going on up into the strait. I could drop that in here. Um, but the other is the, the end of the story is already slated. So save the date. Slate, save, sorry about the phone. Save the date for November 4th. There will be a, a straight science and either Dwayne, I don't know if you're slated or Lyle is slated, but there will be a straight science with the results of the Northern Bottom Trawl Survey. Sounds good. That'll be me. Okay. All right. Well, then we'll see Dwayne back and we'll also, excuse me there. Also, we'll have the surface trawl sur survey results are slated for the, the week after that. So Jim Murphy will be talking about the surface trawl. It's a one-two punch in November. November 4th will be the results for the Northern Bering Sea uh, bottom trawl survey, and then followed on the 10th of November with Jim Murphy, and he'll be giving the surface trawl uh, results. You'll sign to soften them up, Dwayne, and then Jim will bring it home. Right on. All right. So very good. So uh, Dwayne and Lyle, if you want to stay just a little second afterwards, uh, does anyone else have any other questions? Oh, and Lyle does say it's all Dwayne. I'll be tuning in with popcorn. So that'll be, <laughs> that'll be awesome. It will be awesome actually to hear what's going on and it'll be awesome to see um, Lyle eating popcorn. <laughs> so with that, Thank you so much. Next week's straight science will be NOAA Large Cetacean Program, and they're going to be giving us uh, information on the Beluga Whale Survey, the Eastern Norton Sound Beluga Whale Survey that was done in June. So we'll find out a little bit more about our local belugas. That'll be next week, Thursday. Um, tune in at 630. With that, thank you all so much for coming, and we hope to see you back.